Great, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to Preservation Connecticut Spring 22 series talking about preservation. This is our second installment of the spring session, our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm delighted to be your host. Today we're chatting with Tom Shook, a New London historian and researcher of the new Black Heritage Trail in New London. The trail celebrates three centuries of Black strength, resilience, and accomplishment through 15 sites, which tell a story about Black life in New London, while tying into larger themes about enslavement, the Great Migration, and the struggle for civil rights. Before I hand the controls over to Tom, let me give you a brief intro into Preservation Connecticut. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation to preserve, protect, and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. We are statutory partners with the State Historic Preservation Office and I am proud to say that for over four decades, we have successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all over the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. Our office is on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Shown here, it's the Eli Whitney Boarding House built in 1827 for workers for Eli Whitney's factory and it has served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of nine preservation professionals and a board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Staff listed here are always available to assist with inquiries. Chris Wiegren, our deputy director, contact Chris for information on historic preservation easements, our bi-monthly magazine, Connecticut Preservation News, our Olmsted in Connecticut landscape survey project, or to arrange a book talk for his book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee Trebert, our Making Places and Preservation Services Manager. Please contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial sites and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our Development and Special Projects Manager. Jordan manages our communications and outreach to members through social media and email receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities and purport, prepares historic tax credit applications and nominations to state and national register of historic places. Kristen Hopewood is our development assistant and she manages all of the inquiries that come through our website, provides member services, arranges special events, and is the editor of our Historic Properties Exchange, a free listing of threatened historic properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, Stacey Vero, and Stefan Danchuk provide immediate boots on the ground service to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations, museums, historic district commissioners, and more with an array of preservation technical assistance, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic designations, funding, and archeology. span these chats have served as a meaningful way for us to continue our mission during the pandemic. We've been able to connect with the public and hear what's on your mind. Please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions, ask questions directly at the end of the presentation or contact us afterwards for a call or a site visit. And I'd like to thank Mary Jean Agostini for underwriting our 2022 Connecticut Preservation Awards program and for supporting Talking About Preservation. And a quick plug for next week's program, we'll have researcher um, Ken Staffy discussing stories behind historic houses. That'll be next Wednesday. Um, his popular series, House Stories, you can find on Facebook and Instagram. So with that, now I can hand the controls back to Tom. Welcome, Tom. I'm going to stop sharing and you may go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Can you see that? All right. I can see that. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Full screen. 
Okay. Am I on? You're on. Take it away. Okay. Okay. First of all, I want to thank uh, you, Jane, and Stacy, and Jordan uh, for inviting me here in Preservation, Connecticut, uh, to uh, tell this story. I'm really happy to tell this story and, and spread the word. Uh, we're going to talk about the New London Black Heritage Trail, which was about two years in the making. And I'm going to do this in two phases. First, I'm going to give you just a basic rundown about how we did it. And then I'm going to tell you what we did, uh, a little bit about what we did. I can't tell you the whole story, but I'll give you some of it. Uh, first of all, I'm a New London native. I spent most of my life living in New London. And New London history, in my experience, had always been about Nathan Hale, Benedict Arnold, and whaling. And uh, that was what we were taught in school. We didn't hear about things like this, which was uh, in 1717, a guy named Robert Jacklin tried to buy a farm in New London. And, and the townspeople came out and voted to try to prevent him from doing that, from anyone of his race ever buying a, a land or having a business in New London. And I thought, wow, I don't remember hearing about this in my New London history class. Uh, I wonder what else is out there that I don't know. Uh, and I'm kind of a, a I'm kind of a, a, a lifelong Sherlock Holmes fan. So anytime uh, somebody gives me a mystery, uh, I'm interested and I, and I want to help find a find a way to solve it. So here we go. Uh, 300 years later, uh, New London looks a little different. This is the city council in uh, 2019, which is around the time this project started. Uh, things have changed in New London. Uh, and in some historical events have changed. Uh, in, in May and June of 2020, uh, the national conversation changed on the basis of uh, some, uh, some historical events that occurred back then, including the murder of George Floyd. Okay, so that was right about the time that we decided uh, we want to come out and tell the half that's never been told. By the way, that's, I borrowed that title. There's a book called The Half That's Never Been Told, but that's exactly what this is. Uh, this is the New London Heritage Trail, stories that have never been told. This is just a teaser. This is the, uh, uh, a map of the uh, trail itself. And you can see there's a cluster of 12 that are near the downtown area. And there are three outliers that are a little bit further away. We'll talk about those just shortly. There's 15 sites on the trail. We didn't start out to create a Black Heritage Trail. This all started because I retired and I had too much time on my hands. And I started doing, uh, looking into some New London history. And I came across a story of a guy named Ichabod Peace. And uh, he was, an, as it says, an aged color man. He was a, uh, an emancipated slave. And uh, in the middle of a controversy over uh, abolition, education, and black suffrage, uh, which filtered, was a nationwide controversy, filtered down to New London, it became a controversy in New London schools where white parents were objecting to having black students educated together with their kids. I thought, wow, here's another. I never heard of this. This is in 1837 now, in the, at the height of the, it's just the beginning of the abolition movement and the height of a, a lot of that controversy. So Ichabod P stepped forward and said, offered to the city of New London that he would uh, teach the black children uh, in his house. And he was rejected. Uh, he went back a second time and this time they approved it and they agreed to give him $50 a year to run a school for black children out of his house uh, for, for at least two years. When he did this, he was 81 years old. And I thought, my goodness, uh, an 81 year old man with a career change to, to teach kids? My, I need to know more about this. So I started looking into it and I found out what do we know about him? Well, it turns out that when he died in 1842, uh, he had a, a eulogy, his funeral, by the way, prominent people in New London all wanted to be pallbearers. And I thought, wow, this is getting more interesting all the time. His eulogy, is available on Amazon. It was written by the rector of St. James Episcopal Church. How many former emancipated slaves have their eulogy available on Amazon? Uh, so I, again, I'd love to see, what, what do we know about him? Well, he's got a gravestone in Cedar Grove Cemetery. The two, the, the picture, the left-hand side of that picture shows the original, what they look like. And I thought, we need to do better than this. We, it, th th this man is a hero. We need to at least give him the, the dignity of, of restoring his grave. So we got together. Uh, oh, and by the way, a story broke. I, I, I want to tell you this. This is not... Uh, stuff that's uh, that's all in the past. I discovered this last night when I was doing some research, just randomly looking up Ichabod Peace. I found out that 
That discourse that you just saw the cover of uh, appeared on the front page of Frederick Douglass's paper on July 10th, 1857, 15 years after Ichabod Pease died. I thought, this is amazing. Frederick Douglass is aware of this guy, and I'm not. Uh, New London is not aware of him. Uh, so that, and this is an excerpt from, this is a screenshot of the, of the newspaper. You can see Ichabod Pease at the top. Uh, amazing. And that I just found last night. So we decided we, we, we want to do something for Ichabod Pease. Uh, I got together with uh, Laura Natush from the New London Landmarks, and we decided to do a fundraiser that we would give a talk, uh, which uh, the picture on the left, uh, I was with my co-presenter, Mary Lykin. She's in the, with her arms folded in the center. Uh, and we gave a, a presentation at St. James Church, which was the church that Ichabod Pease was a parishioner at for 60 years. Uh, and uh, we, to raise money, we raised enough money. It was a huge success. Uh, we raised enough money to restore his gravestone and his wife's gravestone. And that turned out to be a very fortuitous evening because in the audience, in the center of the picture, you can see my friend, Nicole Thomas and her daughters. Uh, out of the, Laura Natush was the host. Out, just out of, out of the picture is a guy named Lonnie Braxton. Those names are gonna come up in a minute. And in, off to the right was a guy named Curtis Goodwin. Well, Curtis Goodwin was at that moment uh, contemplating a run for city council, uh, and he was inspired by the story of Ichabod Pease. I had not even uh, met Curtis at that moment, uh, and he was inspired by that story, and he got elected, and he was determined to find a way to commemorate Ichabod Pease. So he got together with Felix Reyes, who was the Director of Economic Development in London, and there's Curtis on the right, he was as a city councilor, and uh, they started talking about a way to commemorate, and, and they came up with the idea to say, well, if we're gonna do one, uh, are there any other stories that we should know about? <laughs> well, the answer is yes. Uh, so this went from Curtis Goodwin, he contacted Laura Natush, Laura Natush recruited some researchers, and those are the names I mentioned, Nicole Thomas, Lonnie Braxton, uh, uh, Laura herself and myself. And we, we uh, embarked on uh, starting this project. Uh, we came up with a list of about 35 possible sites, uh, but based on, oh, oh and, and this was a collaborative effort. Uh, there were elected officials, uh, Curtis being a city councilor, the mayor is very, and council were supportive, city administrators like Felix Reyes, there were funding sources, Eastern Connecticut uh, Tourism Dist uh, Council, District, uh, uh, provided some money. Historic pres preservation people uh, through Laura Natush and New London Landmarks, they were involved, community members like me and, and others. Uh, there were marketing and technical development people that were under contract to the city to do the website development and that sort of stuff. And of course, there were the boots on the grounds guys, the folks that actually had to install, reinstall plaques. And those are the guys that installed the plaques. So it was a real collaborative effort. Again, I I'm offering this as a maybe a template for anyone else out there that may be thinking about doing something like this. This is what we did. We selected, we narrowed it down based on money and time, uh, we could do 15 sites. So we had to select sites out of the 30 or 35 sites. And there's more than that, you know, there's, there's 100 uh, out there. Uh, but we looked for stories of courage and community, resilience and progress in the face of bigotry and prejudice. And we wanted to cover the extent of New London history. New London goes all the way back to 1646. So we did cover about 300 years, uh, ancient history, and we have living history included. And you're going to see that in a little bit. Basically, there were two phases of this part. Uh, we wanted to tell the story. Uh, one way we could tell it is on the plaque. The plaque, though, is limited to 150 words. You can't do justice to these stories in 150 words. And somebody way above my pay grade introduced the concept of QR codes, which I didn't even know what they were. That's that little scrambled eggs you see on the left. Uh, that's a, a magical thing that if you hold up your, your, your smartphone to it, it leads you to a website like this which allows us to tell a fuller version of the story. Now, this is the one for Ichabod Pease. You can see we have his emancipation papers on it. We have images. We have, uh, the, the, we can tell the full story. We have a, an image of where his school was. We even have a picture of where, of what we think is the school uh, uh, that's long gone, of course, in, in the one. But anyway, this is what we did. So it was, we developed the text for the, for the plaques and then the text for the web pages. The next phase was figuring out where to put them. Uh, we, some cases were easy. The uh, park on the left is owned by the city of New London, so the city can put in a plaque wherever they want. 
On the right hand side, we're talking about Bank Street, which is the a, a main thoroughfare in, in downtown New London. Buildings are privately owned. It gets a little more complicated. Uh, we have to worry about things like uh, hatching it to the building. Well, we need the building owner's permission. Uh, is it going to damage the facade? Uh, if we put it on the sidewalk, are we going to obstruct traffic, uh, foot traffic, wheelchair traffic? Uh, if we put it near the curb, uh, car doors are going to hit it. Uh, there's already existing signage. And because we live in New England, we also have to worry about snow removal. Uh, so it got complicated. We turned that over to the professionals. These are the guys, the boots on the ground guys that actually installed the things. Uh, we went around, visited all the sites and they helped us, or we, we helped them and together selected a place to put it. This is Bruce Tackling. He's actually installing this uh, one right on that building that you just saw. Uh, and uh, the, the plaque is seven feet off the ground. That was another thing we had to worry about, the, the height of the thing. You want to be able to see it, but you don't want people bumping their heads on it. Bruce is not that tall. He's actually standing on a step ladder here as he installs this in case you were, in case you were wondering. Uh, but those guys did a great job. Okay, that is how we did it in a, in a, in a nutshell. Uh, and again, it was a collaborative effort of a lot of people and funding sources and a lot of work. It, this whole project started, took about two years. Uh, it was unveiled last October uh, 7th or 8th, uh, 2021. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the some of the plaques. This is the uh, Adam Jackson. Uh, the Hempstead Houses is actually a Connecticut landmark site, I believe. And uh, historically, it's been always been uh, talked about. It's, the, it's one of the oldest houses in Connecticut. It's the oldest house in New London. And uh, it's been associated with a guy named Joshua Hempstead, who was a famous diarist. He kept a diary from 1711 to 1758. And it's one of the best records we have of what colonial life was like on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, throughout the, the, uh, the diary, well, from 1728 on, uh, he refers to somebody named Adam. And when, uh, what's her name, uh, Mrs. Uh, de Bonaventura was writing her book, at first she thought, that's for Adam's sake on the right, she thought that Adam must be a member of the family, and it took her a little while to figure out that, no, he was an enslaved person that was purchased by Joshua Hempstead uh, in 1728. Uh, and so she wrote the whole book about him, uh, or, uh, as much as, I mean, that's, uh, the book is focused on him. Uh, and this is how we gleaned information about Adam's story from the book and the research that she did from the mentions that are made in Joshua Hempstead's diary. Uh, he mentions him just about every week, uh, not so much in terms of any kind of uh, real narrative, but simply uh, detailing what, what he was doing, what work he was doing. And you can, you can see, gather from that, that one of the reasons that Joshua Hempstead became, was able to be a shipwright, a lawyer, a judge, uh, a farmer, and, and a host of other things was because he had Adam Jackson doing all the hard labor on his, uh, on his, uh, at his farm and, and several farms that he owned. So he owes a big debt to Adam Jackson, but you haven't heard about Adam Jackson. The other, uh, the other way we, we gained information on Adam Jackson is that his family is in a series of court cases, that's, the, uh, that's from the Connecticut State Library on the left, uh, over covering a period of 30 years where they were negotiating and arguing and debating back and forth on freedom and enslavement. Uh, his, uh, John, his father, John Jackson, was a free man. His mother was enslaved, then she was freed. And uh, per the, uh, the law at that time that was recognized, uh, partus uh, ventrum septum, something like that, it's, uh, the, the status of the child is determined by the status of the mother. If the mother is enslaved, the child is enslaved. If the mother is freed, the child is free. Well, Mrs. Joan Jackson had, was free, had children when she was free, and she had children when she was enslaved. So some of her children are free and some are enslaved. It's a very, very complicated uh, uh, case, uh, dragged out for 30 years. Adam was enslaved. His, some of his brothers and sisters were free. Uh, and it's a, it's a good picture of what life was like in, this, in the early 1700s uh, in New London. We don't usually associate very much. We think of slavery. We think of something that, that happened down south. Uh, but it was extensive. New London, by the way, in 1774, according to Lorenzo Green, the New London was the greatest slaveholding section in New England, New London County.
okay? There were more slaves in New London County. There were twice as many slaves in New London County as there were in any county in Massachusetts. Uh, now, that's a, a fact that uh, I certainly don't remember being taught that in school either, okay? New London, the percentage in the town of New London, the percentage of, uh, generally in New England, the percentage of enslaved people was about 2.3%. In New London in 1774, it was 9.8%. So that's a significant uh, uh, historical fact that we don't know much about. All right, this is the Hempstead House itself. If you look up on the third floor, that's called the garret, the attic. And the picture on the right is, uh, is where Adam Jackson would have lived. Uh, he lived in the attic of the, of the building there. Uh, this is the web page, and you can see we've got the same, some of those same pictures. And there's an excerpt, there's an image down there of uh, Joshua Hempstead's diary. Okay, the next site that I want to talk about is Robert Jacklin. We saw him, whoops, back here. He's this is the guy that was the subject of this action by the town uh, of town, the the freemen, the electors in in New London. He bought a farm uh, about twelve acres, and the day that he tried to buy it. Uh, the uh, officials of the town uh, presented the seller with a caution, warning him not to sell his land uh, that day. It's dated the same day that the, the, of the deed of sale. Uh, and the man who delivered that on behalf of the town of New London, his signature is on it right in the middle of the page. His signature is Joshua Hempstead, the guy that we were just talking about. He was the, what would be considered the first selectman of the town at the time. He cautioned him not to do it. Uh, he bought the land anyway. It took him a year before he could get it recorded. Uh, and he kept it for about two years and then he sold it. And the report is that he was, he was subjected to a lot of har harassment. Anyway, he left. He later went, Robert Jacklin went to, uh, he, he moved to a farm in, uh, in what was called the North Parish. It's now Montville, Connecticut. Uh, and then he bought uh, 120 acres in Salem, Connecticut, where he became the first black landowner in Salem. He lived there for a short period of time, eventually moved down to Ridgefield, which is where his family uh, developed. Uh, he, had, he, he bought another farm down there, and that's where he lived the rest of his life. And his children also uh, bought farms down there. Uh, there's a whole write-up on that in the history of Ridgefield, by the way, on the Jacklin family. Uh, but three of his, at least three of his descendants fought for the Patriot side in the American Revolution. And that's worth noting. This is the place where, uh, this is where he bought his farm. I, I was, uh, I spent a lot of time down in City Hall in New London, looking up property records, trying to find these properties. Uh, and so this one drove me crazy for months. I couldn't find it. If you've ever looked at property records from 1716, it says, you know, the corner of the stone wall down to the uh, 15 rods to the walnut brush by the ditch. Uh, and it says along the highway. And of course, all the roads are called the highway. There's no names, there's no street numbers, there's nothing. So you, you have to do it, you have to figure it out by uh, who's in relation to who and, find, and try to find one and then you can, you can figure out the rest of it. Drove me nuts. So one night I was texting my friend, Nicole, another researcher, we were, we were chatting and uh, she was uh, researching the person that we're gonna talk about next, Florio. And she said, she's gonna look in Joshua Hempstead's diary. And I thought, wow, they are contemporaries. This is, I wonder if it's listed. I wonder if my guy is listed anywhere in there. Well, it turns out he is. He's mentioned a couple of times, uh, but I couldn't find anything about the property. So uh, I looked up the, the person, Florio, that she was uh, looking at. And it was late at night and I'm sitting there thinking, I'm just turning the pages and I'm saying, hey, Tom, go to bed for crying out loud. You're not going to find, I, something made me keep turning pages. And all of a sudden the words Pike's Lot, Pike's Hollow jumped off the page. And it's, it startled me because Pike's Hollow is the name of the property that Robert Jacklin bought. And I thought, oh my goodness. And it turns out that uh, this appears uh, at the time, Joshua Hempstead was with Adam Jackson and he was measuring the distance from his house, the Hempstead house, to a farm that he bought out in an area called Cohansey. And he was describing the streets he was walking along and or on a wagon, I think, and, uh, and marking off half mile markers. At the one mile marker, he says he's at Park, the Pike's Lot. Well, this is exactly where I thought it was gonna be. It's right, it's in a hollow. There's a hill uh, to the left and there's a hill behind me in this photograph. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it that uh, how did this happen to me? So I owe a big thank you to Joshua Hempstead, Adam Jackson, and Nicole Thomas for finding 
whoops, finding this property. It was, it was just uh, an amazing story. So yes, the plaque is there now. Uh, it's a 12 acre plot. Okay, Florio, I mentioned, uh, Nicole was doing the research on Florio. And this is another story that, uh, that people don't know a lot about. Florio, there is a marker here in the, in the grave at the ancientest burial place, the oldest cemetery in New London. And this is the marker that was, uh, that it, it was transcribed from the original stone. And it says, wife of Hercules, governor of the Negroes. Well, what is the governor of the Negroes? People, many of us don't know anything about this. Uh, and that's the only evidence that we have of, of, of who it was. Well, it turns out that uh, the governors of the Negroes were an elective office uh, chosen in many of the towns around the state. Uh, they were not, there was not necessarily one at a time if different towns uh, had different, they had what they called the governor. And he was the leader of the black community, uh, of the enslaved community. Uh, and uh, he was generally chosen because he was a good speaker and he was a, a person of, 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 of strong temperament. Uh, and uh, while they didn't have any real influence over the, over the white folks in the area, they were looked up to and considered uh, mediators and judges of issues that ar arose in the, in the black community. Now, the, the white community as a rule kind of looked at this. If you read uh, Francis Manwar and Calkins, who did the history of New London and the history of Norwich, famous uh, uh, New London historian, uh, she describes it as kind of a mock ceremony, as if it were, uh, yeah, just kind of a fun and games uh, and, and kind of uh, really putting it down. But, and that may have been the attitude of a lot of these white community because they didn't understand what was really going on. That's not the way it was perceived in the black community. It, in addition to, to providing themselves with uh, community and leadership and, 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 and helping the community, uh, it was also a way for them to preserve African uh, rituals and African ceremonies because when they did their celebrations, the white folks didn't understand what they were doing. What they were doing was recreating, in some cases, things that they had done in Africa. And it was a way of, of uh, preserving the culture, which we're, this is only recent scholarship has turned this stuff up. Uh, people didn't realize that for, for the longest time. Okay, this is a listing of the governors. Uh, now, they're not listed in chronological order. They're listed by town. I have different colors for the different towns. Uh, you can see some of them overlap. Uh, but there's a lot of them. It goes from about 1750 until around 1850 uh, at various times. And I put Hercules at the top in New London colors, by the way, green and gold, uh, because it appears that he may have been the first one and he's the least known of them. Most of the scholars who review uh, the, the Negro uh, governors in Connecticut don't even mention him. Uh, the only mention that's made is that, that's, is that that stone in the cemetery. So we are on the case, Nicole in particular is on the case. We're trying to, we're going to find out more about, about who Hercules was, because it may have, he may have been the first one. Uh, several of, of, the, uh, uh, of the governors of the Negroes were uh, prominent in terms of uh, civil rights uh, activity. Uh, and this is one guy here. By the way, the, on the picture on the left is a depiction of the uh, inauguration of the Negro governor. This was, uh, I think, depicted of a Hartford, uh, one of the governors in Hartford. Uh, but the guy on the right is a guy named William Lanson. Uh, and he was a Negro governor in 1825. He was from New Haven. He was an engineer and a, and a contractor. Uh, and uh, you may have heard of, uh, you probably are familiar with Long Wharf in New Haven, correct? Well, there was an extension to Long Wharf. This is the guy that built it, okay? He had a company of about 20 or 30 uh, fellow black workers who, uh, who quarried the stone and built the extension of the uh, Long Wharf. He also built the New Haven section of the Farmington Canal. This is virtually unknown. Uh, people, uh, it, it's only recently been, been, been written about. Um, also, uh, he was subjected to ongoing uh, harassment, uh, legal authorities, uh, the police and, and the uh, legal authorities who were uh, not pleased to see his prominence. Uh, he owned houses in a section, I forget the name of the section of New Haven, uh, and it was a, there was a black community over there. And uh, he eventually ended up uh, impoverished. 
and he died in poverty. Uh, he was prosecuted relentlessly uh, for, you know, any, any, anything that could get him on. Uh, what I recently discovered uh, myself, and I, I can't verify this, but I happen, uh, I'm hoping to soon. Uh, I've also done some research on Prudence Crandall School and the names of the kids. There are a lot of people that are doing that. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Rysenka is writing a book on it. And I came across the name of one of the students named Harriet Rosette Lanson. And she's a student at Prudence Crandall School. And she's listed as a ward of the Reverend Simeon Joslin. Well, it doesn't list her parents. Reverend Simeon Johnson was a white abolitionist minister in a black church in New Haven. He was friends with William Lanson. Okay, Ancestry.com says that Harriet Rosette Lanson is the daughter of William Lanson, okay? Not every uh, account gives that connection, but I, I, I think that that may be the case. And that's just a real interesting connection between the black governors and Prudence Crandall's school, okay? In addition to that, William Lanson and several other uh, governors of the Negroes were active in the civil rights movement in the 18 teens, 18, actually from 1818 to 18, the 1860s. Uh, you may be familiar that uh, prior in around 1814, uh, black suffrage was denied. And then when the new constitution came out in Connecticut in 1818, it specifically said uh, the vote is only allowed to white males over 21 of owners of property. Uh, blacks, women, and Native Americans were not included. So uh, William Lanson was one of the guys, along with there were several other separate uh, petitions filed with the legislature, uh, or requesting, demanding, petitioning. Uh, th th what they said was basically was that this is taxation without representation. We are being required to pay taxes, but we can't vote. Now, if you recall, we fought the American Revolution over that, okay? Taxation without re representation. Uh, between 1818 and uh, 1865, there were 30 petitions submitted by various uh, black civil rights groups and various leaders in the community to, to, uh, requesting uh, a review of that and requesting black suffrage. Every single one was denied. Blacks did not get the vote in Connecticut until the 15th Amendment was passed, the federal 15th Amendment in 1869 or 70. And even then it took until 1876 for Connecticut to change its laws. So anyway, this is one of the guys that was fighting on, on the civil rights fronts. Interestingly enough, one of the other guys who filed the petition was Sarah Harris Fairweather's father. Who was Sarah Harris Fairweather? She was the first black student at Prudence Crandall School talking about the connection to the school again. This is another one of the sites in New London. What people don't know is that uh, there's, there's a, a biograph biographical information collected at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, Fairweather family was from Rhode Island. And uh, in it, it says that Sarah Fairweather, who was married to George Fairweather, a blacksmith, and Sarah and George uh, in 1841 moved to New Haven, Connecticut, bought a house and lived there till 1855. Well, I started looking through that and I thought, I found out, that's not true. They didn't move to New Haven. They moved to New London. And here's a map. Here's the house. This is an 1850 map of New London. If you look down the lower right, you can see G. Fairweather right there on the map. Uh, they moved to New London and they lived there. For, I have the deed, uh, uh, signatures and everything. They lived in New London from 1841 to 1855. Uh, nobody in New London knew this. Uh, uh, to the left is George Fairweather's blacksmith shop. That's on property that was owned by a, a whaling agent uh, named Williams. Uh, it's a long, complicated story there, fascinating uh, sometimes, but I can't go into it now. It was suffice to say that there, there was a school built on that property called the Williams Memorial Institute, WMI. It's now the Williams School uh, on the campus of Conn College in New London. My mother went to school there at uh, WMI. Okay, uh, WMI moved up to uh, Conn College and it was taken over by uh, St. Bernard's High School. Uh, the Diocese of Norwich. Uh, I went to high school there, okay? My mother went to high school there. I went to high school there. None of us ever knew anything about Sarah Harris living there or that George Fairweather had a blacksmith shop right there. And if you notice some of those other names on that, on that photograph, they're backyard neighbors with Henry P. Haven and Francis Manwer and Calkins. Okay, Henry P. Haven is another, uh, one of the most prominent whaling agents in New London, wealthiest guy. He's donated the money to build the New London Library. 
His half sister is Frances Marion Ranwaring Calkins, the woman that I mentioned, the historian uh, that wrote the history of New London. They're backyard neighbors to, uh, to the Fairweathers. Across the street is an abolitionist named Civilian Haley. His name's going to come up. And up in the right hand corner is Sarah Harris's sister, Celinda and William, uh, William and Celinda Harris Anderson. They live three blocks away. Uh, so it's a, it's a fascinating story. This is the plaque that's on the Fairweathers house. Uh, this is where it was located. Uh, the house is no longer there. Uh, the, the house is located approximately where the arrow is. Uh, there are two houses that was demolished back around 1865 or so, and these two houses were built. But that's where the plaque stands right now. And around the corner to the right is the blacksmith shop and the, the, and the schools. It's now a courthouse, by the way. Uh, these are the Harris sisters. There's a whole fascinating story of the Harris sisters in New London. Sarah, uh, I mentioned uh, she had a sister, uh, Mary, uh, who was another educator. Uh, Celinda Harris was, was something called a come outer. Uh, they were all involved in civil rights, black suffrage, education, uh, and uh, including uh, Olive Harris, uh, who, is, who actually ran a school for a time for black children in New London that nobody knew about. Sarah's children, she had eight children, I think. Three of them, you can see by their names what her involvement was. Her first child, who was born the same day that the school, the Crandall School was attacked in Canterbury, the same day, uh, she named that child Prudence Crandall Fairweather. They had an, another child, Charles Frederick Douglass Fairweather and William Lloyd Garrison Fairweather. It tells you a little bit about how the, involved they were in the movement. Okay, 73 Hempstead Street, arguably the most significant built house in New London in terms of, of, of the black history. It was built in the 1840s by civilian Haley. I mentioned his name. He's on that map. He was a white abolitionist, put his money where his mouth is. Uh, folks wouldn't sell, were reluctant to sell to blacks in New London. He built five houses and sold them at cost to blacks, which became the core of one of the first black neighborhoods in New London. The, oh, the first owner of that house, oops, jumping ahead. The first owner of that house was John and of the of the first house was John and Lavinia Ruggles Parkas. Now you might recognize that name. Lavinia Ruggles had a brother. Okay, his name is David Ruggles. Uh, they were from actually, it's believed that he was born in East Lyme or Lyme, and they grew up in Norwich. And he went to New York. He founded the Committee of Vigilance. He was one of the strongest abolitionist freedom fighters. Uh, in, in, in America at that time, he's credited with freeing 600 uh, fugitives, helping 600 fugitives gain their freedom, including Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass got married in his living room, okay, married by a guy named Pennington that I'll mention a little bit later on. Uh, it's amazing the connections that all these, these, these uh, that exist that we're just discovering. So Lavinia Ruggles, there was another sister that, who lived over in, uh, on Federal Street in New London. So they were the first owners of the house. Not the most famous owners. Oops. What? There we go. Uh, this is Sadie Dillon Harrison. She is uh, uh, part of a very prominent family from Philadelphia. She came to New London. Uh, she was the head of the, she was executive secretary of the United Negro Welfare Council. This is around 1926. She bought that house in 1926. By the way, the, the Parkus family and their descendants owned that house from about 1845 until 1926. So they owned that house for almost 100 years. And they sold it to uh, Sadie Dillon Harrison. Uh, she operated it as, well, she was the secretary of the United Negro Welfare Council. Her and her brother set up a, 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 a bank in New London called the New England People's Finance Corporation, one of the first banks uh, that would serve Black customers uh, in, in New London. But she was aware, through her connections, she was aware of how difficult it was for Black folks to travel in Jim Crow America. And I say that very specifically. It wasn't Jim Crow South. It was Jim Crow America. We know that there were 10 Green Book sites in New London, okay? Now that wouldn't have happened if, it did, if they didn't need it. Uh, so she became, in 1930, uh, in 29 actually, she started to compile a booklet, a pamphlet uh, of sites that would accept patronage from black customers uh, because it was legal at that time to deny service uh, whether it be gasoline, uh, restaurant, uh, overnight accommodations 
you, it was legal everywhere to uh, discriminate on the basis of race. So she compiled a book of 300 cities, okay? And she did it the old fashioned way. She didn't call up Dr. Google. Uh, she did it with telephone calls and letters uh, and put together the Ho Hackling Harrison Hotel and Apartment Guide for Colored Travelers, came out in 1930. Why is that important? Because that's seven years before the Green Book. We're all familiar with the Green Book. We're familiar with that. She did this seven years before the Green Book came out, okay? And this is the Green Book. Every single listing that's in Sadie Dillon Harrison's book is in the Green Book. And this is not to take anything away from Victor Hugo Green. That was a phenomenal accomplishment that he did. He expanded it. His, his, uh, the Green Book lasted for 30 years. It included much more than the Hackley and Harrison Guide. She limited it only to overnight accommodations. He has gas stations, barber shops, beauty shops, restaurants, tariff, everything. He's got everything in there. Uh, but, uh, oh, this is where Sadie Dillon Harrison did it. The original house is in the, in the black and white picture. Her house is the one on the right. Uh, the, and in the, uh, in the newer picture, the big brown house in the center is what it looks like today. It doesn't look anything like what it looks like, what it looked like when it was built. But that's her original house. That's where she wrote the Hackley and Harrison Guide. It's the only precursor of the Green Book in American history. It's the only one that came before the Green Book. She deserves some credit for that. She deserves national recognition for that. OK, and why is that important? Here's a head to head comparison of the of her book, 1930 and uh, the Green Book. And you'll notice uh, the Green Book is in green down below. You notice the listings are identical. OK, even in, I think they're even in the same. Are they in the same order? Maybe not quite. Uh, she did the heavy lifting for Victor Hugo Green. Uh, and there's one additional thing. Uh, in November of 1929, Sadie Dillon Harrison was contacted by one of the two most prominent black men in America. And he asked her if she knew of a colored boarding house in New London. He was coming to New London, he needed an overnight stay. And he knew that he could not stay at the Mohegan Hotel or the Crocker House, which were the main uh, accommodations here in New London. Uh, and Sadie Dillon Harrison knew why too, because if you look, they're listed at the top of her page. And there's a large W after each one of those names. The reason the W is there, if you look at the legend in the book, that means white only. So the Mohegan Hotel and the Crocker House were white only. And when W.E.B. Du Bois contacted her for accommodations in New London, he stayed at her house. It was W.E.B. Du Bois who was not allowed to stay at the Mohegan Hotel. Uh, it, it, and this is 1929. Uh, he was very prominent at that time. That's again, that's a story of, uh, that's, our, that's, Amer that's our American history. Okay, so. Sadie Dillon Harrison has also recently been commemorated in London. This is a week ago. Uh, they, uh, there's a dedication of a, uh, what they call a public art for racial justice education, a mural in Fulton Park in New London. And that's Sadie Dillon Harrison. If you notice, that's the same picture that's right there. That's what they based that picture on. Uh, that's, that's her image. And that image appeared in a, a, a journal of Negro life in March of 1928, which is the exact moment that she was living and working in New London. So that's a, that's a perfect picture of her. The other two uh, people on that is Anton Dassant. He was a black whaler in New London and uh, Commander Merle Smith. He was the first black graduate of the United States Coast Guard Academy. Uh, and that's brand new. That's, that was just unveiled uh, May 22nd. Okay, that, history, that house also was home to Linwood Bland who was a civil rights leader in New London, president of the NAACP. He and Sarah Cheney helped break the color line at the local banks, uh, and, and he fought for uh, equal, equal rights and, and voting rights uh, for years and years in, in New London. And that house was also, uh, when, when Sadie Dillon Harrison was out of town, she worked out of town for a period, it was that tourist home was operated by a woman named Clara, Les Clara Lancaster Fulford, okay? She lived in that house. And why is she relevant? Because this is her nephew, okay? Her nephew, Spencer Lancaster, he's 92 years old in this picture, okay? Uh, he is also commemorated. He is an example of living history, okay? Let me, um, let me introduce you to, oops, let me introduce you to Spencer Lancaster. Give me one second to do this. Oh, where are we? Oops, oops, ah. Uh, 
That's the wrong one. Wait a minute. <laughs> Where am I? Here it is. Okay. Sorry about that. On Thursday afternoon, New London City Councilor Curtis Goodwin and Felix Reyes, Director of the City's Office of Development and Planning, unveiled a plaque outside the home of Spencer Lancaster, the first black elected official in the city's history. So when you're given a talent, don't bury it. Use it. And that's what I try to do all, all my life. Use my talent to get something better for everybody. Now, I look at this outing right now. This is New London. This, this is New London. And that is Spencer Lancaster. That took place last October. Uh, and the video is courtesy of the New London Day. Thank you to the New London Day. Uh, let me see here. This is Spencer Lancaster. In 1960, he was the first black elected official in New London. He was elected selectman. That's a flyer from his campaign. And that's a photograph of him uh, taken at a panel uh, on a panel discussion on the Green Book that I participated in. I did a slideshow on the Green Book sites in New London and Mr. Lancaster and several other, uh, other local people, elders gave uh, their stories of living and growing up in Jim Crow America. It was a fascinating and poignant moment. And one of the most amazing things was that when I, was, when I met Mr. Lancaster that night, uh, it turned out that in 1953, he was actually living in one of the 10 sites that were listed in the Green Book that neither one of us knew that until that very moment when I showed him the, the address. Uh, he, was, he was born, uh, he was living there when he got out of the Navy, uh, Army rather. And he said, uh, he turns to me, he says, and you know, he says, uh, and this is my daughter, he said, uh, who was with him that night. She said, uh, she was born when we were at that house. I was like, I was amazed. And believe it or not, in 2019, uh, he still had the same phone number that was listed in 1953 when he lived at that address. It was just kind of a fascinating uh, coincidence. He's a wonderful man. Uh, this is the, pla the plaque that's mounted at his house, installed at his house. It's the only plaque on the trail that's on a private property at the request of the family. It's actually at his house. When he, he and his wife bought that house in 1954, a petition was circulated in the neighborhood to prevent him from moving in, okay? It did not prevent him from moving in. He, uh, he, in fact, he's been living there ever since. He just now, his, his health is failing a little bit. He's about 94 now, and he is in some assisted living at, at the moment, but his daughter still lives at the house. This is 60 years later. Okay, this is a, just a summary. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, the Black Heritage Trail. You can see the cluster of uh, 12 that are kind of close together. Uh, and then there are three outlier sites that are probably best visited by a car. It's a little bit of a, a far walk. Uh, and, uh, but it's not the end. Uh, this is a book that was published in 1990 in New London. The plan is to expand the Black Heritage Trail. Uh, and also to expand it to include other ethnicities. This, is a, this book was, if you notice, each chapter of the book is, uh, is dedicated to a different uh, ethnic group in New London. New London is the epitome of a diverse melting pot city. Uh, we have the Native Americans, African Americans, uh, Acadians, uh, Jews, Poles, Greeks, Irish, you name it. Uh, they're all in New London, and they're all deserving of recognition and commemoration at some point. So at some point, we hope that this whole thing will be expanded to include everybody. Uh, the Black Heritage Trail is part of the Connecticut Freedom Trail now, and it's also part of the Thames River Heritage Trail. The, the Thames River uh, is a cluster of sites that are on both the New London and the Groton side, and they're accessible. They have a, a boat that will take you back and forth across it uh, to visit it. I encourage you to come down and, and try that out. Okay, Black history is American history, and New London history is a microcosm of America. There are many, many New Londons out there that could do the same thing that we did, and we hope that this may be an inspiration to folks to, to, to do something similar. And thank you very much. I'm done. <laughs> thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I can, I don't know if you want me to, I'll, I'll leave, how about if I, I leave this up? If people have questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Let me, let me, uh, I know some questions were submitted, but is it okay if I start with those, Shane? Sure, yeah, okay. go right ahead. Okay, 
Uh, one question just mentions that they have an interest in East Lyme history. I live in East Lyme, by the way. In fact, uh, where I'm sitting right here is uh, at one time was part of the Nahantic Indian Reservation. So I'm very interested in, in exploring that. That's another whole story that needs uh, exploration. Is New London's Black Heritage Trail a walking tour? Uh, yes. Uh, the 12 sites that you see listed up in the upper half of the screen there, uh, it's about a two mile, little over a two mile walk and it does form a loop around New London. Uh, and yes, you, you can walk that. It's, it, there's a bit of a hill there, uh, but once you get up to the Fairweathers, if you start at Adam Jackson and move up to the Fairweathers, it's up, uphill. After that, it's all downhill and it's easy. Okay. Uh, Many discoveries were involved in this project. Do you think there are many more to come? Oh, yes. Uh, is there one area of research in particular need right now? Well, that's a big question. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, yes, there is still a lot more to come. Uh, I just want to focus on, um, I'll mention a couple of things that have, have happened uh, just recently. Uh, in the course of uh, developing so, uh, one of these programs, we discovered that uh, the Anderson's house that I that I mentioned uh, uh, that with the sister of Sarah Harris that lived a couple of blocks away. Well, it turns out that uh, their house was given to them by an elderly gentleman, and it was given to their eight-year-old daughter uh, in 1843. Uh, and that's an amazing story. I would love to find out what did that happen. Uh, Henry Highland Garnet, the famous black abolitionist and orator stayed with the Andersons in that house. And he's the one who told us that Olive uh, Only was running a, 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 a school for black children that was totally unknown. Uh, her husband, by the way, is the, is the Frederick Olney that was just uh, uh, unveiled as the author of that uh, Whaler Merrimack journal that turned up, that was given to the US Custom House a few months ago. Oh no, a couple of years ago. Uh, that was her husband. He's the hero of the Prudence Crandall School. A fire, he, he put out the fire at the Prudence Crandall School 10 years before that. It's amazing. What, how these, and these things are just coming out now. Uh, that also, that Anderson House, uh, in looking through it, uh, and, and, and because I've done some research on the Green Book, uh, interestingly enough, the Anderson House is next door to one of the sites that was in the Green Book. So we have uh, and the Andersons, by the way, were rumored to have been involved in the Underground Railroad. So we have the Underground Railroad at 51 Shapley Street next door to what, what Candace Taylor calls the Overground Railroad, the 20th Century Green Book. They're right next door. And of course, Urban Renewal has taken care of both of them. They're totally gone. There's no evidence of it. There's a high rise apartment there now. Uh, but that's a site that should be commemorated. That's, that's an amazing site that, the, that both of those buildings are next door to each other. And we didn't know that uh, until just now. Uh, I also mentioned that, uh, that Frederick Douglass uh, uh, post, uh, published an, the article about Ichabod Pease. Uh, this is new stuff. I, I, honest to goodness, I, I, can't, I stumbled on that last night. Uh, and I've been doing researching Ichabod Pease for four years. I never knew that until last night. So yes, there's a lot more over there. Uh, one area of research in particular need, one of the things that I'm really interested in, I, I did a, a talk on the Harris sisters in New London recently. And what I discovered, and again, this is something that it, it takes research to see, and, and, and it's not visible necessarily right off the bat, but uh, are the connections that exist in the community that we had no idea of. Uh, I'm going to show you this one first. This is just a constellation of the Harris family. These are the Harris sisters in the center. And if you look around the loop of that thing, look at the names of the people that they were connected with. Uh, you're going to recognize some of those people. Uh, the, the New London abolitionists in the upper left, Ichabod Pease, Miranda Glasgow, and Isaac Glasgow, the, the blacksmith, the famous blacksmith for whom the town of the village of Glasgow was named. Uh, the passage of the Black Law, the come outers, the, uh, uh, the, the whaling people down in the lower right, uh, national, uh, nationally known abolitionist speakers like William Wells Brown, William Nell, Stephen Foster, Abby Cobb, they're even connected to the Amistad, okay, through civilian hailing. Uh, so there are connections like that. I did a Green Book uh, talk on uh, air, uh, for a group up around Hartford. So I included some Green Book sites in Hartford. And it all started with this little building right here. It's, a, uh, it's the Faith Congregational Church, 
Well, it turns out the Faith Congregational Church originally was the Talcott Street, back, uh, Talcott Street Congregational Church, which is connected with all of these people, okay? And if you look at this, this is JC, James W.C. Pennington. He's the guy that married Frederick Douglass in David Ruggles' living room, okay, in 1838, okay? He was a teacher and he was a pastor there. Uh, Augustus Washington was a, uh, a teacher at the Sabbath school at this church. Augustus Washington was a daguerreotypist who took the first photograph of John Brown, okay, <laughs> in, his, in his studio in Hartford, and amazing. So, uh, and, and then you see David Ruggles and all this. Uh, Civilian Haley was instrumental in getting the captives on the Amistad free. Uh, and uh, they stayed, uh, J Pennington was, oops, Pennington was also involved with the Amistad people. All of this stuff is, is all related. So if there was one area, it's, it's, it's discovering the, the sense of community that existed uh, in the black community, in, in places like New London and, and everywhere else. There's, there's a lot to uncover there. It's amazing. Okay. Uh, someone asked, uh, I don't have the names next to these, unfortunately. My question is around how we uncover the active lives of folks the history books have left out. That's, that's what a lot of this is, that's for sure. Interested in the lives of people of color, women, and Indians from around 1650 to 1750 would like suggestions on books to read or even how to do research during this time period. I've read, for Adam's sake, a couple of times. I need more sources. Well, the first thing that I would recommend, and this is for people, for those of us who are in southeastern Connecticut, is this book right here. Uh, where's the camera hit? Black Roots of Southeastern Connecticut. Uh, this is like, I don't know if you can see this, but this is my copy of it. And it's fallen apart. I have used this, I have worn this book out uh, because there is so much material in here. You can see it's all, it's all broken. I bought a new copy and I keep it in plastic just to, to preserve it. This is my work copy. Uh, that, and there was a companion book called Tapestry, this, the, which explores or expands some of the stories that are in Black Roots. Black Roots is, uh, is an unbelievably comprehensive listing of uh, they, they poured over uh, uh, public records, school records, uh, property records, uh, er birth and marriage records, everything imaginable. And as a starting point, uh, if, you, if there's somebody you're, that you were interested in, in, or you just go through it and pick somebody, and you can start exploring uh, stuff. It's, a, it's a, an invaluable resource. Uh, there are other things. Uh, well, for example... These. This is the Green Book. Okay, uh, you'll find a lot of sites in Connecticut that are listed. I I only uh, pretty much limited my study to the ten sites that are in New London, but there are sites all over all over Connecticut. Uh, and if you're, in, I'm not sure where this uh, uh, question comes from, but there are lots of uh, sites around Connecticut that were involved in the in the Underground Railroad. There's all sorts of. Uh, other other references. Uh, this is a book that, from a, a it might be in the time period that that you're with. It's called uh, "To To Do Good to My Indian Brethren: The Writings of Joseph Johnson." He was connected with Samson Occam, uh, who was the Mohegan, uh, who was connected to Wheelock, who ended up founding uh, Dartmouth College and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of Native American history in that. Here's a book on David Ruggles. Uh, in which the author claims that he was born in Lyme. Everybody else says he was born in Norwich, so I'm, I'm rooting for this guy. Uh, but it's a great, a great book on David Ruggles. This is a book that you, you, uh, I just stumbled on it, uh, and it's an amazing story that, that we were never told in school. It's called Six Months on a Slaver. Uh, Many, uh, thank you to Ann Farrow and the, the uh, writers at the Hartford Current who did an, uh, a series back around 2002 or so on uh, slavery and uh, black history in Connecticut. And she wrote a book, they wrote a book called Complicity. And it's a history of, uh, of Northern complicity in, in, the, in the slave trade. And she mentions that in 1860, there was a ship called the Thomas Watson in port at New London that was being outfitted as a slaver. Uh, there was a whaling ship that was being converted to a slaver. And uh, don't, if you recall, uh, the international slave trade was outlawed in 1808. So 52 years after the, the trade was outlawed, 
New London is involved in outfitting a slave ship. They ended up when the, people got wind of it, they snuck out of town and they went to New York, which is this sort of thing happened a lot in New York. And six months later, that ship delivered 800 captives from Africa to Cuba. OK, this is in 1860. Uh, many, many. This is an unknown story. Well, a guy on that ship wrote a book. Uh, of a, he thought he was going on a whaling voyage initially. Uh, and he wrote an account of that whole story. It's an, it's an amazing story. And again, it's one of these stories that's never been told. Uh, I would also, I, I do need to put in a plug for these folks right here at Connecticut Explored. Uh, the, uh, if you go through their catalog of stories, they have done some wonderful things on, on, on uh, especially black history, all kinds of, uh, every history of Connecticut. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I have an article in there this month, that's just by coincidence. But anyway, there's some wonderful, wonderful uh, work being done that's being promoted by that magazine. And those are all starting points. Uh, resources that I use, uh, you know, I, I, I've used all these. There's there's some online sources. My friend, Dr. Google, that's how I found that story last night. I was just doing a search and I popped up something five pages deep in the, in the uh, you know, if you go to Google, it gives you a, a listing of 15 or 20 things. And then you go to page two, page three. Well, I was five pages in when I found that one. And I was like, oh my goodness, uh, it's amazing. So if you're persistent, there are tons of stories out there that haven't been told though. And uh, so I hope that people will be encouraged to uh, find one, uh, discover one and pursue it. All right, that's the end of the questions out there. I hope I, <laughs> I, hope I answer that question, I don't know. I get, uh, uh, there are so many things out there that still need to be dis discovered that we've only, we've only had seen inklings of. Uh, and it's a, it's one of these things. It's a whole world. Like when when I went into that the world of the Harris sisters in New London, uh, you go the further you go into it, suddenly the whole world opens up, and you find out there are fifty people involved in that circle, white, black, men, women. They're all involved in the abolitionist movement in London that we we didn't know anything about, or very little. Okay. <laughs> well, that's terrific. Thank you, Tom. Oh open up the floor if anybody had a question they wanted to ask before we close out. I see in the link that we found visitnewlondon.org seems to be the official landing page for the Black Heritage Trail. So if you wanna look correct. at that before you go out. So thanks Rachel for putting that in the link for us, in the, in the chat for us. Yeah, we did. I did talk about, uh, I think, five or six of the sites that are on that walking tour. But if you look through, there are some others that I, I haven't even uh, been able to touch on that are just as interesting as, as the ones that I did get to talk about. I'm sure. Well, thank you so much. This was really a terrific presentation and your, your research is inspirational. And thank you for sharing your ongoing project and research with us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, uh, to share this stuff and eager to uh, hopefully uh, inspire or, or motivate uh, younger people and other people to do, to do some of the same, because these stories like this exist in every town in Connecticut. I'm sure every town, every town in the country mm -hmm. has, a, has a story like this. Absolutely. So. Great. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Okay, thank you.